fun of isolating bird club broadcast. We've got lots coming up. No, you know this. So no. And that's because we've had a bit of an internet dilemma this morning. About a couple of minutes before we were going live, the internet switched off entirely. So we've had to switch on to 4G. Um, so we're trying best. Hopefully it will all be OK. Um, however, I noticed a few spots. OK. So there's already a couple of technical issues going on uh, as i said the internet just dropped out so we are having to do our very very best um but that means that we are not under shelter and a few drops of rain um spit out so you ran off to go and get I, an umbrella i've just been in to case. get a very large volley just in case we uh, suffer a downpour mm -hmm. um so we've lost our internet um, yeah all of the other bullies are somewhere else. Um, we've got two wet poodles. Two wet poodles. Uh, but we the do wind have some, is blowing things around. But we do have some interesting guests and things for you today. So yeah. what have we got coming up? Luke Massey. Luke Massey is Luke out. Massey. Luke is, uh, has left his home in one part of Spain and travelled to another. Um, he's in pursuit of bears. Yeah, as he's been promising us for quite some time. So we're going to have to wait and see what comes from his adventure it's to been find a, the bears. And all, uh, all spring and summer promise so far. From, 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 from It's a big promise. Though. It's it a, big, is a, big. a tall order. It's a big ask. Spanish know. bears in daylight. And he's, yeah, he's tried really hard, hasn't he? But, you know, you have to wait and see. <laughs> Yeah. what the outcome of that will be. Uh, Hedgehog Hugh, Hugh White, is mm -hmm. going to be joining us very shortly to talk about his new book and other uh, issues surrounding hedgehogs and also with some top new science he's yeah. just told us. Oh, it's very exciting Very science. exciting science. We love, we love, love science. that. We've learned yeah. something from Hugh really exciting already mm -hmm. today, so that, that's good news. Uh, Lindsay Chapman will be joining us later. Uh, she's got mm -hmm. a follow-up to the grass snakes swallowing the frog. Yes, if you remember a couple of photos from last week, we saw that grass snake in pursuit well, catching that frog, but it was catching it bottom first. Yeah. Which is quite unusual Big and we asked you know what was the outcome of that did it actually swallow it well we have the answer we've got the photos yep. to show you yeah uh, we've also got a mindfulness uh, moment from uh, Stuart Abbott I like this one it's very good actually I like them yeah, yeah and I do yeah, I like it's this very one very good indeed it's a new yeah. take it's done it's something that most take. people don't do because they don't like going out in the wet no but we love going out it's so calming isn't it we you know the rain I said we love watching it through a window Yep. Some of us like going out. I love going out. I've got an app on my phone that plays rain and thunder at night. I know, I hear it. <laughs> He's snoring away to thunder and I can't get any sleep in the oh, other room. That's great. That's yeah. It's Brilliant. great. There's a storm Brilliant in stuff. two minutes. Anyway, I'm moving, <laughs> moving swiftly on from snoring thunder. Uh, our soapbox this week is shark finning. Yes, this is an issue that's very close to my heart. Um, something which I have been trying to campaign about for a really long time. And there is an aspect of this industry which not many people realise, not many people know about. So I'm going to show a little bit of that with you, share a little bit of that information and uh, also shocking. hopefully direct you to a petition as well, which would be fantastic if you could please, please help. Yeah. Hey, hold on. Before we start, listen, I'm going to take my fleece off because I've got a new T-shirt. I just want to show off my new T-shirt. Literally arrived this got? morning. There we are. Look. For, for fuck's sake. For fuck's sake, keep the ban. A design of a fox like on that. there. Yeah, there's. I, I've yeah. got one for you as well. Have you? Yeah, oh, yeah. Black thanks. one with a different design. Oh, you know me. I yeah, thank that. you very much for that. Uh, we'll be doing a little bit of uh, promotion of that a bit later on. And now, before we start, though, uh, the the e action. We were talking about it last mm. week, following Hen Harrier Day two weeks ago. Uh, the RSPB Hen Harrier Action and Wild Justice launched an e action. Now, an e action is something that you can do easily online, and this one's really easy to do. You go to wildjustice.org.uk. Mm slash SOS and in the top uh, corner of your screen is a little box you click that and then by entering your postcode you're able to instantaneously send a very polite email to your elected representative anywhere in the UK your MP MSP whatever it happens to be and uh, the letter that goes to them is just saying to them look we've got a real issue here with the criminal persecution of mm. our raptors. This may be something you're not aware of, or it may not be of immediate concern to you, but would you please just think about it a little bit more yeah. and think about taking some action. Now, at the moment, the total is on about 93,000. It's good. It's, it's, it's much more than we ever expected, it isn't is. it? It's incredible. It, it is, it yeah. is. Um, it wraps up on uh, on Monday evening. And at the moment, I mean, I like 93,000. I'm very grateful oh, that, good. you know, 93,000 people have ticked the box and they've sent an e email. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I personally just can't live with the 93. I need the big one zero well, zero. It's like you're going to go and run the London Marathon. You don't stop a couple miles before the finish line, do you? No. You've got to keep going. So look, uh, if you yeah. if you were you know if you haven't yet 
click that little box, um, then please think about doing that. It would be fantastic if you do that. Well, if you I have done it, would you um, then pass the, the link mm -hmm. to your friends and your family and, as you said last week, the postman? Your poodle. And well, not your poodles. Because, you know, they struggle with their postcode. They can't ever remember it, so they can't help very much. But... You know, if you have any Homo sapiens that you come yeah. into contact with, that from a safe distance, of course. Over eighteen, I suppose. Over eighteen Homo sapiens, um, then in the UK, then they fit the category. So share it around. Yeah, I don't listen. You've got to be over eighteen to vote. Do you have to be over eighteen to send an email to your elected I representative? Don't, I don't no, think you don't. So. No, I don't no. see why you should have to no. be. You don't have to be on the electoral no. register. So any age, there we are. So any send age. that out. And if we can get that up by a few thousand mm. this morning, that would be fantastic. At the moment, we've got 93,109. You can see that on the screen there. And that will go up, hopefully, throughout the broadcast. And that we'll keep mentioning it. And that hopefully we'll see that figure change uh, and get We could try and get up a closer. thousand this morning. A that would be fantastic. If we got it up to 94, we've got six to go before Monday night. And that would be really good. And this mm. is all about, as I said, this is not an anti-shooting agenda. This is about a crime. This is about wildlife crime. It's Illegal. killing birds of prey you know beautiful species like hen harriers our red kites lots of poisoning uh, of buzzards white-tailed eagles golden eagles all all being killed principally on driven grouse moors mm -hmm. but not exclusively mm -hmm. but principally on driven grouse moors and this spring you know the, the tragedy expanded when uh, some people went took their, their dog for a walk and it ate some bait that a poison bait that had been put down to kill birds of prey and the dog died now can you imagine that I uh, just wouldn't feel safe, you know, if you're taking small children up into the countryside and things like that, and there's poison bait lying around your dogs, your children, anything. I mean, it's it's absolutely horrendous. Well, it's I mean, yeah, this is the 21st century. I absolutely mean, it's, it's, it's disgraceful. Anyway, yeah, OK, look, anyway. if you can sign it, we'll remind you a bit later on, of course, because we're really keen mm. to get this one up. Quiz? Quiz. Let's do the quiz. Why did so, you put your coat on, by the well, way? Well, because it was going to rain and, you know, it was it looked cold sort of, this morning. I'm basking. I'm like, I'm, you know, you I'm, 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 I'm here like some I'm, sort of, you know. I'm quite cold. Ectothermic animal, you know. <laughs> I'm endothermic. I'm on the endo scale. I don't need your coat. What have you got a rubbish t shirt on underneath there? No, I've got a perfectly all right t shirt. <laughs> you got anything on under yeah, there? Of course I do. <laughs> well, I just wonder why you, why you wanted your coat on. I've got, a t I've got to prove it now. Okay. Yeah, I all do. Right, I'm, right. Just, I'm just getting chilly. Okay. All right. Okay. What about the quiz? <laughs> Sorry. Honestly, right. So, <laughs> obviously, every week we ask you to identify a quiz. A name. Here we are. Uh, okay. You can hear it now. Mm. Mm. So that's a good one, I think, because it's an yeah. unexpected noise. It is, yeah. It is noise. It's a noise that I used to hear a lot more than I hear now. Yeah. Although I have heard it this year, actually. Have you? Yeah, I have, I yeah. I went uh, down to, um, uh, to that, uh, I can't tell you because that's going to give it away. <laughs> it huh. was just before lockdown. I went somewhere where you would def very oh, definitely yes, encounter one it. of these animals. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. there we are. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Luke Massey is one of our correspondents. He's living mm -hmm. out in Spain where he's meant to be restoring a farmhouse, but uh, clearly... Oh, he was doing the roof the other day. I got sent a photo. As oh, he was on the roof? Yeah, I got sent to a Katie, his partner, sent me a photo. Luke Massey <laughs> is, is restoring an old farmhouse. And his family <laughs> are safe and dry and will be warm in the wintertime. But, of course, he's, uh, he, he's a great naturalist, a brilliant photographer, stills photographer and filmmaker, of course. We were talking last mm -hmm. week about the film that he'd made with uh, Stacey uh, called... Katie, Katie Stacey, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah. <laughs> Katie. Um, uh, about uh, called Last Song of the Nightingale. Mm. I think that might still be available on the Bird Fair website if yeah. you want to watch that. It's fantastic. Beautiful film. But he he's always got itchy feet. He's out and about. And this week he's moved to another part of Spain in pursuit of those bears. Here is Luke. Coronavirus has pretty much wiped out all of my work. But on a positive note, that means I'm forced to stay at home, which is brilliant. And when I say home, I mean Spain. And I've been on the farm for quite a while now, but now I'm exploring basically around and about the area. And I've come two hours kind of southwest to Castileon, up to here, to see what I can find over the next few days. The 
behind me is an absolute blizzard of house martins. We were just passing along the road above us and my girlfriend Katie saw along the line just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of birds. And yeah, I don't know if they bred here. I can't actually see that many nests. I don't think I've ever seen this many house martins all together before. I thought it was time that I finally put some of my photos in one of these segments. The next day I headed up to a lake and first thing in the morning there was a huge group of swallows and martins dipping and diving, drinking and bathing in a mountain lake. And up in those high peaks there's a really varied array of bird life. You've got surprising species um, and more common species. For us in the UK we're expecting to see red leg partridge in the countryside but here you can find them 1500 metres and higher calling out from the rocks. Ravens cronking. Wheat ears perched on rocks too, but for me the real star of the show were the harriers, especially this beautiful dark morph Montague's harrier. Carpenter bees are something that I've seen a few of in Asturias, but with Castilla Leon being a little bit further south and a little bit warmer for longer, you see a lot more of them. And of course there's lots of butterflies too. No idea what this is. A spider. I'm going to call it a pumpkin spider, because look at that abdomen. What's really impressed me about the area is that they seem to love scrubby areas, which is fantastic for birds as well. Where I live, I'm bringing back hedgerows on the farm, but lots of other people have grubbed them out, and they're pretty tricky and hard to find. But here in Castile Leon, every single field is bordered by willows and wild roses and stuff like that, which provides the perfect habitat for birds. But it's not just birds that live in Castileon. If we're really lucky, we may cross paths with a bear. I just had a bit of a nature nightmare with a silver lining. We were up kind of up here as a big storm rolled in. And just as that storm rolled in, in this field, a wildcat came out to hunt. So I expertly filmed that on my phone, as you can see. And then as the storm and lightning got worse, we came down here and I went to tell someone about the wildcat, or Gato Montes as it's known here. And uh, they told me, oh, well, there's a bear with two cubs that just crossed literally this stony area here as well. So while we were watching the wildcat, the bears crossed. But, you know, we're lucky to see the wildcat this year. It's quite hard to see them. So we're lucky to see that. And who knows, we might catch up with some bears in the next few days, hopefully. One thing I found really interesting here is this chap behind me is a Spanish Mastiff. And the reason I'm not getting out of the car is because they can be quite unpredictable. And the reason it's here is because, now I can't see any of them, all around us there's horses and cattle and calves and um, foals with the horses. And these dogs are livestock guardian dogs. So they're here as a basically full-time security detail for the livestock because of the bears and wolves in the area. And I find that really interesting because where I live, we have problems, problems with wolves and livestock. And you see very few of these dogs living with the flocks. But here in Castileon, almost every single flock I've come across has had one or two or maybe even more. Yesterday I saw a flock of loads and loads of sheep with four very, very aggressive ones, hence why I'm not getting out of the car. This one seems a little bit friendlier. Um, but I don't know where he's gone. And then he's got a mate sat further back that hasn't approached the car just yet. A local farmer I bumped into yesterday recommended I come up here to look for bears because he'd seen one around here recently. But the weather's really closed in, so visibility is pretty rubbish. And there's loads and loads of places for one bear to hide. So I think our chances are very, very low. But someone else told me, because it's an old coal mining area, it's a really good place to find fossils. And knocking about here in these old slag heaps are a load of different fossils. I found some on these pieces and then on here there's a beautiful fern, I guess. Uh, an ancient leaf that's been covered up and squidged and however fossils are formed. I'm certainly not a paleontologist or anything like that. We may have found fossils, but for this trip, we haven't found any bears, but that's the reason to keep coming back and keep searching. I will make it my mission to bring a bear to the self-isolating bird club at some point. But for now, I'm leaving Castileon's wildlife behind 
and its incredible scenery and heading back to my farm in Asturias. They eluded him yet again, those mm. sneaky, sneaky, tricky bears. Sure, Wildcat, though. Well, I mean, that is pretty cool, isn't that, it? In daylight. Wildcat. It was an amazing thing. You know, I'm not sure. What, what Would you like to see Wildcat during the day or the bears that were moving up atop? I'd go, I'd go for Wildcat, yeah, personally. Yeah, do you know what? I'm like. I thought he was going to find some bear poo. Yeah, or some footprints or something. Lou's a, it looks a bit mm. short on poo at the moment. I mean, you know, because bear <laughs> poo is, you know, is quite distinctive. Yes. When I've been in uh, the United States in areas where there have been bears. It's not hard to find their poo. No, no. It's scattered I've, I've, all over the park. Oh, it's bear poo, and it has a very particular smell. I mean, yep. um, yeah, it does. Full it of really berries does. and all sorts of things, mm -hmm. I mean, presumably at this time of year. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe some... Hey, look, Luke, <laughs> we greatly admire your work. Thank you very much for your contribution uh, this week. Fantastic <laughs> birds there. Great to see some photographs. All those house oh, martins. What stuff. a sight that must yeah. have been. All of those house oh, martins stunning. on the wise. Stunning yeah. stuff. But um, <clears throat> if you don't... Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't get the bears, then um, how oh, about some poo? Some, Sorry, Lee. Yeah, we'd like to see some, you know, fecal matter from... Um, Chris would like to see some fecal from, matter. I'm, you know, I, I, I'd quite happily, you know, if, if oh, there's some evidence. In fact, if you get cool. a really good oh, slab no. of bear poo... Uh, poo uh, You're no, not bring, you don't want it at home. I, I, just, I haven't, don't have any in my collection. It would be quite something. Oh, uh, I don't know why I've never brought any home. have got a lot of poo in the house. Should we move on? I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today, we're really pleased to say, is Hugh Warwick. Hedgehog Hugh is mm. joining us this morning. Good morning, Hugh. Hello. Here we are. Coming, coming. You see, I thought, I thought Fabian was unmuting me, but no. Um, no. I just got to say, you got given a T-shirt. I got given a T-shirt, but I think mine's even better. Here we go. Ross oh, Hogg. I, I, yes. I Look at that. That um, is a smart T-shirt. This was uh, Climate Action North, uh, a wonderful bunch of people uh, up in the Northeast um, sent this through to me. And uh, no, I, I'm very happy with my Boss Hog T-shirt. Uh, so, yes. Uh, but other hedgehogs. Yes. Yeah. Hugh, look, we, you've got a new book here, which we're going to talk about. Um, it gives us an, mm -hmm. uh, an excuse to talk about the subject of the book, of course, which is the hedgehog, something very close to your heart. But before we do, tell us about the book. It's all encompassing, isn't it? It's, it, and it? Basically, it's everything you need to know about hedgehogs in one petite volume, beautifully yeah, well, illustrated. A petite volume, but, but with loads of lovely photographs, too. I, I mean, I've been really lucky. Uh, Grafeg got in touch with me, uh, the publishers, and they, they do a series of these books. And they just said, well, I'd like to do the Hedgehog book. Um, you know, you're never going to get rich out of this sort of thing, but why not? And I just thought, you know, yeah, I mean, my third book on hedgehogs. I, I've got one more book on hedgehogs up, uh, up my sleeve, as it were. Uh, and then maybe I'll call it a day on books on hedgehogs. Uh, but it is, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's short. It's only 10,000 words, but it's got the uh, the ecology of the hedgehog. It's got all the natural history of the hedgehog. But it also goes into the bits of the hedgehog that people don't normally um, spend time thinking about, you know, the way that we've used it uh, in art and in literature, that we've used it in, um, uh, yeah, even, as you got there, even ancient Egyptian, Sumerian. Um, Let me show you. This is, this is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. This is uh, an ancient Egyptian hedgehog, a little beautiful little glazed mm. ceramic model of, of, the, of the hedgehog. Amazing. There. You don't really realise our strong cultural associations with these animals. They no, go back to thousands of years. Thousands of years. You know, they're referenced in Shakespeare. I've just seen some great quotes which are in the book from Shakespeare. And, you know, all these different kind of artefacts and things that hint at our really strong relationship with them. Yeah, but interestingly, the, the use of the hedgehog in the Shakespeare is to do with its Celtic name, uh, which I am now going to say wrong, um, uh, which is Grainog or something, Grainog, or, uh, uh, um, and the Welsh, the, the Irish and the Scottish Celtic names for the hedgehog all mean uh, versions on the ugly one. And so there was a very interesting, you know, our association with the hedgehog has been largely uh, changed since Beatrix Potter and Mrs. Tiggywinkle over 100 years ago. But prior to that, the hedgehog was an animal filled with portent, filled with, with some suspicion because it, was, it seemed to disappear for half of the year. It was covered in prickles. It was snuffly. It would appear at night. Uh, I imagine people would stub their toes on a hedgehog when there were plenty of hedgehogs around. Um, so there were reasons why people would find them something to be cautious about. Now, of course, they're the nation's favorite animal. I keep having to say that. Every time I do, do, do bird fair, or something like that. Yeah, you know, the first thing I have to point out is, yeah, birds, whatever. Hedgehogs, the nation's favourite animal. <laughs> it's important to get that in there, I think. You know, every time. Every time. Yeah. It's the nation's favourite animal, but in some places it's declined by 97%, um, which is of, you know, some grave concern as an understatement. Um, tell us a bit about your petition, because you, it, it's doing fantastically, I've got to say. 
Well, I mean, I, my petition was doing really well, and then I appeared on the, the lockdown version of the Self-Isolating Bird uh, Club, and suddenly it, it, it accelerated. It did a Sonic the Hedgehog-style whiz up the slope of numbers, and it was it's now just about to hit 800,000. I'm, I'm keeping it going because it's a really valuable platform to keep uh, um, spreading the word about what we can do to help hedgehogs. I'm keeping it going because we don't have a government yet that is able to do other things other than worry about Brexit and COVID, both of which are very serious. I'm not you know, diminishing those. But also I'm keeping it going because we've now got a bunch of independent hedgehog observers out there who are doing the work that government should be doing. They are seeing the new developments happening in their area and they're going to the developers and they're saying, excuse me, um, could you put in hedgehog highways? And there's uh, um, a fantastic chap in Thurston in Suffolk who has gone through each of the three developers working in his vill around his village. And these include uh, uh, Bovis or Linden Homes um, and uh, Persimmon and um, has written to them and said, Oi, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, Bovis, Linden Homes have got back and said, we're already doing hedgehog holes. Persimmon came back and said, nah, go away. We're not interested. Uh, but he kept on at them. And he wrote a series of polite letters and they have now exceeded. They're going to do it. They're going to make hedgehog highways part of the development. It's not the solving of all of the hedgehogs problems, but it's removing one of the obstacles, to their ability to move between our gardens. And we should say the petition is simply asking government to make these hedgehog highways in new developments mm -hmm. mandatory. Absolutely. It's the smallest ask possible. Uh, when change.org, the, the, the website for it is change.org uh, slash save our hedgehogs. Uh, when they first contacted me and said, yeah, what do you want to do to save hedgehogs? Uh, yeah, anything, anything which we can do to return them to their former glory. Uh, my response um, um, generated an interesting one from them. I suggested we just dismantle industrial capitalism and replace it with something nicer. And, uh, and they, they just said no to that one. Um, so we've had to go for, for this, this smaller ask. But the result of a smaller ask is, yes, I'm communicating with nearly 800,000 people. I've had a meeting with a housing minister and developers have already, and Bovis Homes in particular, have signed up and said, we're going to make our hedgehog, all of our new developments hedgehog friendly. OK, so we must encourage people to, yeah. to find that petition. That's at change.org. You can find it there. If you haven't, then please do. And again, mm -hmm. pass it on to, to everyone else. Um, I, I imagine having got to 800,000, it's a big ask, Hugh, but the million would be awesome, wouldn't it? Oh. So change.org have got this absolutely vicious cycle of self-flagellatory messages which come up. And so I was at 499,999 and I was really excited and then it clicked over. I was awake, I stayed awake just to do this, to get the screenshot of clicking over to 500,000. And the message which springs up next to it, because up until that moment, be, can we reach 500,000? The next message which springs up is, not can we reach 700,000? No, can we reach a million? And it was suddenly you've gone from these 100,000 increments to this 500,000 increment. And uh, yeah, that was just a small bit dispiriting. But yeah, we've, we've got to 800, nearly 800,000. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. 800,000. I think it is feasible. I think also we should mm -hmm. encourage people, as, as you uh, mentioned there, your correspondent, to, to approach the developers direct. If, the, if a development proposal mm -hmm. has been approved and you're living in an area where you know there are yeah. hedgehogs or, or there could be hedgehogs, then why not just go to them direct? They don't have to be the big ones like Persimmon and, and Bovis. They could be a smaller developer and they may even, it may be even easier for them to implement these changes. Well, no, you're absolutely right. And, and what... Uh, um, uh, uh, Jonathan Housego, his name was, I remember now, uh, has done, and he copied me into the communication. It's just gentle, persistent, and polite. And those are absolutely crucial. I mean, shouting at people is not going to get you anywhere with this sort of thing. It's got to be that really gentle persistence. And th you know, we've had that news just in the last few weeks that the hedgehog has now been shifted onto uh, our, our red list of mammal species, now vulnerable to extinction. I mean, the reason we didn't have it on beforehand was the lack of research, not to do with the lack of hedgehogs. It wasn't, there wasn't the grounding of evidence. Now we've got more evidence and it is, you know, the Mammal Society filled out this um, uh, um, and we are now there. The hedgehog is vulnerable to extinction. We've sort of known that for a long time, but it shows the absolute importance of, of um, not only the individuals of the Hedgehog Observation Corps, which I think we should actually have t-shirts for, uh, but also of the researchers who are out there uh, all over the country. And I should say the Hedgehog Street Campaign, along with the British Hedgehog Preservation Society and the People's Trust for Endangered Species, have funded so much research now across the country and they continue to do so because, I mean, it may seem very niche. And I, I, I tease bird watchers all the time about the popularity of hedgehogs. But the point is when you help hedgehogs, you're helping so much else. The hedgehog is like the, the, the one species which we can get the most agreement on. 
Anything else is going to provide some sort of degree of, of dissent somewhere. The hedgehog really doesn't. And it means that we can then help the other less charismatic species, um, you know, the amphibians, the reptiles, the insects, even the birds, uh, uh, by helping hedgehogs along the way. OK, now you mentioned that they don't pr promote any dissent, um, but um, I, I can't agree with that because uh, recently, I think it was almost, I think it was on Spring Watch or Winter mm. or Autumn Watch recently, I, I talked about hedgehogs eating slugs and an enormous number of people oh, um, yeah. sort of piped up on social media and said, you idiot, you don't know what you're talking about. They eat other invertebrates, beetles and so on and so forth, which they do, of course. Mm -hmm. But look, Mr. Hedgehog, what about this slug debate then? <laughs> I, got caught slugs, up, they? Yeah, well, I got caught up in this recently and, and it's, it's, it's deeply frustrating because I mean, I, I've, I've been out radio tracking, following, studying hedgehogs um, on and off for, for 30 years and um, outside in the wild watching hedgehogs at work, they will eat slugs. Healthy adult hedgehogs will eat slugs. Slugs may not be the most important part of their diet, but they are a part of it. And I think my problem is, is that uh, there is a really an understandable fear on the part of some hedgehog rescues that if we, if we sort of tout the idea that all hedgehogs eat is slugs, um, that, that then when people have a garden which has got full of slugs and no, no other invertebrates to speak of, um, they're going to say we don't need to put out food or help our hedgehogs because there are loads of slugs. And we tie that in with the fact that there, is, there are a number of different parasites which cycle through the slug into the hedgehog, including nasty lungworm issues and things like that. So um, it, it's something which I, I grounding stuff in science, you know, actually having this sort of uh, and observational empirical data. You see stuff, you, you check con stomach content analysis, you do the DNA analysis of the hedgehog species. Um, yes, they inevitably do eat slugs. They're not the most important part of their diet. And if they're eating lots of slugs, it can lead to um, the, you know, the build up of this parasite. But these parasites are hedgehog specific. These are specific uh, parasites which have evolved over you know, hundreds of thousands of years to be part of the cycle. The issue is to do with the general health of the wider environment and the health of the hedgehogs themselves. Um, so if the hedgehogs are healthy, they're much more able to throw off and deal with these sorts of parasitic infections. But it leads to this other remarkable piece of uh, science, which was published just yesterday, um, work done from the Gower Bird Hospital, um, and, and it's looking at the capacity of using slugs to check whether there are hedgehogs. And it's just one of those left field bits of thinking which made me joyful to be part of the scientific community. Uh, what they thought was, well, there are, so the Crenosoma is a, it's a, it's a, it's a nematode parasite. It's species specific, Crenosoma striatum, and it will only live in the hedgehog. And part of its life cycle goes through slugs. Finding out whether you've got hedgehogs on a site is quite difficult. You've got to send an ecologist out with a torch at night for many nights. You've got to employ Henry, the hedgehog searching dog. Um, or how about you go collecting slugs? You could just leave a few pots out, go collect slugs, grind the slugs up and see whether you've got the evidence of this <coughs> parasite, Crenosoma striatum. And uh, what they've proved is you can do this. You can now, they, they checked it with scoma with no hedgehogs and the other animals on it and slugs on, um, uh, on the gower. And you can do this. You can now um, uh, work out whether there are hedgehogs in an area by counting slugs, well, collecting slugs, and um, having a look at whether they've got the DNA of this nematode inside them. Um, it's genius. Whether it's going to be scalable up or something we can use for serving, I don't know. But as a piece of science, it's absolutely wonderful. That's amazing. That's great, Honestly, it? I love the tips of science that are just, I don't know, that just blow your mind like that. That's something really exciting. But Hugh, there's one question that I do really want to quickly put to you because I know we are running out of time a little bit. Um, but I feel like it's a really important one from um, a member of the audience. So Laura Morgan has just asked, Hugh, do you have an article about writing to house developers? I'd like to share the story with my town council who are facing unfriendly developments. Could uh, this approach be used for various different issues so is there a kind of a structure somewhere or i don't know a letter somewhere that people could give out or something you know or any recommendations in terms of approaching these developers um, if you go to to my um, petition site uh, change.org slash uh, save our hedgehogs i've actually got a number of updates i've written on there and they, they do piece together the evidence which is necessary i haven't done a form letter for people just to copy and send because everybody's situation is completely different and i think it's important also that these are genuine I don't want to flood this with people who are just uh, um, you know, ticking about, I mean, with the best respect to the work you're doing with the MPs. But I mean, it was um, because I actually want this to be very, very carefully focused on the individual planning applications. So that, but if they go to the, the, the petition site, they'll find out uh, um, 
a vast amount more information about how to approach. And I will I will have a ponder on this. Actually, I there's a there's a Facebook group I run called Hedgehog Highways, and on that. Um, actually, you know what? That may be my job today. Is actually sort of work out the standard things to ask a developer when it's time, when you find yourself confronted by that. So, so have a look at the Facebook group. Uh, my moderators are going to love me for saying that. Um, <laughs> Hedgehog Highways, they're going to really love that. Yeah, <laughs> good, good. That's really Wonderful. good. Uh, I, was, I was about to suggest that might be your, your work today. Uh, here, we've run out of time, but before we do, oh. we just say that the, the book is published on the 10th of September. There's talk of a launch event, which will be something that people will have to contact you to sort of book into a, a, a Zoom that you're going to do to, to talk about the book. So uh, details of that will be available on your social media coming soon. So you can find... Um, uh, use social media and, and book up for that event. Uh, the book goes on sale, as I said, on the uh, 10th of September, 9.99, beautifully illustrated. I've got to say, there's some fascinating things in here, lovely photographs. And again, it, 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 oh, look, there's the one we like. We like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I just found it because we featured this one a little while ago. Look, this no, is the, this is extraordinary. This is an eagle owl, European eagle owl, eating a hedgehog. Look at that. Cool. We're not eating, carrying it to eat it. There, yeah, look at yeah. that. Pray for her offspring. Superb stuff. Hugh, thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. A quick shout out to Nick Upton, the photographer who supplied a lot of photographs in that book as well. Um, amazing, amazing work he's done with that. And at some point, it'd be lovely to chat to you about the complications surrounding photographing a, a nocturnal mammal, which is quite secretive. <laughs> indeed, yeah, indeed. Absolutely. All right, thank you to Nick as thank well. Thank you very much to Nick and Hugh. Yeah. Yeah, cheers, Hugh. Bye. Bye. Superb. That's cool, isn't it? 800,000 really signatures. Cool. Oh, it's I'm very, very good. Yeah. I know. Goodness. I know. a lot, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. So, anyway, should we go on to soapbox? It's your soapbox today. I'm going to take a second, very much a second back seat on this one. It's not that I'm, 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 I'm unconcerned about the issue, of course, but it's your forte. So it's off, my forte. Off you go. Okay, so of course, shark finning. Now, when you think of shark finning, I'm sure you think of these kind of fishing fleets, often illegal fishing boats that are out somewhere, perhaps in the Mediterranean or off the Spanish coast, catching sharks and shipping them over to Hong Kong or areas in China where, of course, they are made for shark fin soup. Now, the whole um, process of shark finning is quite brutal. They use non-selective methods. So they'll put out long lines, deep lines. They'll catch all different types of sharks, rare species, endangered species. Um, and their fins will be cut off and the bodies will be thrown back alive in the water mm. and as they drown and suffocate. Now, of course, there's about 97 million sharks are killed annually by humans. That is a huge percentage. We know that sharks are in severe trouble in our oceans. They are really important for regulating our ocean systems. They are just, I mean, we couldn't have our oceans without them, quite frankly. Um, very, very important and very misunderstood animals. I've worked with sharks quite extensively and I have to say they are very curious, very interested, but cautious and careful creatures. They are so fascinating. Their behaviour, they've got personalities, they've got all these intricate things um, and they're just incredibly misunderstood and persecuted. And of course, the main reason we believe that's the case is for shark fin soup which of course is very true but we also have to look about the issue on our own doorstep too and now this is the thing that i think most people will be surprised about so there was a lot of research being done um, i'm just going to read this out to you so this goes for uh, from 2019 to 2017 so an unearthed analysis found that the UK sent almost 12 tonnes of shark fins worth £92,000 to Spain in the first five months of 2019. In 2018, the UK exported 29.7 tonnes of fresh shark fins worth £216,000 to Spain. And in previous years, they've exported over 10,000 tonnes. Oh, well, can we just be clear about this? Because this is new yeah. to me. Um, is this UK fisherman catching sharks, taking their fins, and then we sell it to Spain? Uh, not quite so much because of the type of sharks. So uh, slightly yes, but also they're imported and exported. I see. And there's a big loophole here. So um, legally, you're not allowed to go and do shark finning around the coast of the UK. We've got 32 resident shark species around the UK, which people don't know about. We've got endangered species like port beagles. We've got blue sharks. We've got basking sharks. Even thresher sharks sometimes pass through. And thresher sharks are really cool. We've got these long um, <laughs> dorsal. Oh my god, amazing, mm. amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so go and check all those shark fins out because they're uh, shark, shark species out because they're really, really cool. But of course, with all those sharks, there is going to always be a little bit of persecution. Now, in the UK, there is this legal loophole where we're not allowed to actually sh uh, fin the sharks that are here. However, 
each individual person entering the UK can legally bring up to 20 kilograms of shark fins in with them. 20 kilograms. Now, that is enough to make... You see, the thing is, mm. you're not allowed to bring so many things into the country, quite yeah. correctly, animal products, you know, mm. byproducts of animal uh, harvesting, you know, under the CITES regulations and yeah. so on and so forth. And if you get caught in the airport, they confiscate them and you face, you know, potentially fines yeah. and custodial sentences, depending on what they are. But and not, yet you can bring not shark, shark fins. fins in. Not shark fins. That is a massive loophole. It is a huge, huge loophole. And a lot of shark fins do come in to the UK. Um, and so that basically 20 kilograms of shark fins equates to about 705 bowls of shark fin soup. And on the black market is worth 3,600 pounds. It's a lot of shark fin. Well, no wonder people are smuggling it in. Yeah, then. it's being smuggled in. It is still being consumed in some restaurants. I've done some investigative stuff on this and there's a, there are a particular restaurants that do serve shark fin soup. However, and this is the big however, you know, we, we look at shark fin soup, we blame it all the time. But we've got to look at our own fish and chip shops. Yeah. So research was done recently and found that 90% of fish and chip shops were actually selling shark species. And these are shark species that are found in UK waters, things like spiny dogfish. But they're not labelled as spiny dogfish. Of course, that sounds rather unappetising. Um, so these sh these sharks were once abundant in the 1920s they have significantly reduced in population due to pressures for catching for our fish and chips and they're sold as um flake they're sold as hus i think we get there's a list of all these different names we have a little look we don't eat fish we've got small. rock salmon we've got um sir dog we've got hus flake we've got different all these different things if it's not labeled if you're all getting cod or haddock the chances are you are getting cod or haddock but if it is named something a little bit obscure, like flake or hus or something, chances are it is probably going to be shark. Shark and chips. Shark in your fish and chips. And this is something that's absolutely horrendous. And these spiny dogfish are now, you know, known as vulnerable. And yet we're still consuming them. And we don't know about it. We don't know that we're consuming them. So many people have got no idea because they're not labelled as sharks. Okay. Which is absolutely horrific. So... What we're going to do, uh, well, what an amazing petition is doing at the moment is to highlight this issue. Um, if you can find the petition in the comments, please, please, please do sign it. The UK government is very much against shark finning. They've been very vocal about that. Um, but before we left the EU, there was they were unable to restrict the laws on this. But um, hopefully now we're out of the EU. So one positive that could potentially come of this is that we can get that loophole down and make sure that people cannot import that 20 kilograms of shark fin into the UK. Um, so that is essentially what the petition is trying to do. And from 8.30 this morning, I had a little look and we were at 50,901 signatures. So please, please, please. Is that a please, government e-petition? This is an e, this is a, a petition on, um, yes. Yeah. On a government website. Yeah. So we need 100,000. We need 100,000. To get a parliamentary debate yeah. or the equivalent. Um, now we're under COVID and there were certain restrictions. Um, so I, what are we on? Uh, 50,901 from 8.30 this morning. I okay. hope that's gone up a little bit. Okay. Please, please do sign it. This is a really important issue and not many people know about it. So mm. do some research, talk about it. Um, you know, get the conversations going because sharks are incredibly valuable. We need sharks. You know, they've been around longer than trees have. That's, you know, they evolved long ago, so long ago. Oh, honestly, I'm getting all hot. Okay, no, you've been very hot up. They're so good. It's a very comprehensive guide to this issue. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Beast. That's that's excellent. And do sign that petition. Please do. Yeah. Okay, should we calm down now? Yeah, calm You're going to need it. I need, I need you to... need a mindfulness moment. Oh, you need a mindfulness oh, moment I from do. Stuart Abbott. Yes. And Stuart Abbott was a regular contributor to some of our early SIBC things when we were in lockdown. He was giving us, uh, you know, mm -hmm. updates very, very regularly. But he's been out into a local piece of woodland in the pouring rain. The soundtrack of this oh, is, it's beautiful. is beautiful. And so here we are. This is uh, a bit of mindfulness. From Deep Stuart breaths. Stuart Abbott. You ready? Gonna yes. relax to this now? I'm Calm ready. down after all the shark issues. Ready? Over to you, Stuart. Thank you. 
Yeah. See, I like it out in the rain, yeah, if I'm very honest with you. I do. Yeah, we had all that hot weather, didn't we? And the moment that the rain came and we got all those thunderstorms, you and I immediately went outside. I know. St- Are you, stood you, in the garden. Well, you stood a little bit closer to the door than I did. I didn't I have did. any shoes on. I just didn't want wet <laughs> socks. But, uh, I mean, you know, then I did stumble yes. out into the rain. But, I mean, yeah, being out nice. in the woods when it's all dripping, the colour oh, is so much more intense. And the smell. The smell. It's lovely. It's an extraordinary experience. Yeah. And I love that that, that thrashing sound of, of, of rain. I'm not sure. Mm. Look, let's see if I can just do a little bit of my app. On here. App. You know, the my, rain app. That's what I have to listen to every night. Okay, let's have a little bit of... Just waiting for the thunder. It takes a little while for the thunder it's to build, build up. Right. It's got to build up. Yeah. How long are we waiting for it to build? Uh, the, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, I've got the thunder turned right up. String? Anyway, this I can't... Oh, there's some thunder. There we go. I have that on at night sometimes if I can't sleep. Three or four in the morning, stick that on. I know. Still listening to it at five o'clock in the morning. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You've got to try, haven't you? Should we, should we throw over to Lindsay? I think we should. Oh, we, people are getting fed up with us wittering on this morning. Mind you, your soapbox was it? No, your soapbox was excellent. It was it was a really good, comprehensive guide to shark finning. Lindsay, good morning. How are you? Good morning to you both. I absolutely love the sound of the rain as well. I find it very calming, but it's raining so much in Manchester and it's so dark that I've had to retreat inside. Not for me, but for all my electric kit, which wouldn't enjoy it very much. I also have one of those apps, by the way, Chris, but mine plays the sound of the waves. And my partner says it just makes him need the toilet, but I find it very relaxing. There you go. Um, Hedgehogs, so much chat about hedgehogs this morning. Thank you for covering that in such detail. I've got my book here. Uh, and I have to say that this is one of my favourite images. Can you see that? Oh. Hello. Oh, yes. It's just stunning. So we've got the combination there of birds and hedgehogs, as Hugh is talking about. Absolutely gorgeous. Quick one from Janine Mason. She says, please persuade my husband to make a hole in our garden wall for hedgehogs or I will name and shame him. So there you go. It's happened. You need to cut that hole in the hedge. We've got one in the back garden. I've got a little brick as well, a step up for hedgehogs. Put out water, put out some cat biscuits, encourage those hedgehogs in. That would be brilliant. And um, you did mention, both of you, at the very beginning of the show, Steve's Young's, uh, Steve Young's grass snakes. Now, um, this, there's just incredible photographs of what happened next. So basically, the grass snake uh, was predating on a marsh frog, and a lot of people wanted to know what happened. But look at these results. Have you seen these pictures in close up, both of you? They're stunning. Yes. Well, I, I zoomed in. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Look at that. I know, but the key thing is that it is succeeding yes. in eating the frog backwards. It's, it's not, it doesn't it's, look very comfortable. Look at the look on that snake's face. And you can see it in, in its um in its body there. You can often see that big bulge, can't you? After the snakes yeah. have eaten, you can see it, and yeah. it goes through the body. Sometimes you cool. can, I hate to say it, but sometimes you can see the bulges moving whilst they're still in the stomach. Yeah. Yeah, you said that last time. I know, you? sorry, did I? Yeah, you okay, did. Yeah, I'm, so maybe I've got a perverse interest in, in th- things being any, eat, eaten alive. Feces, things being eaten alive, anything that's got a little bit of an ick factor. <laughs> yeah, I remember you got very excited with that hedgehog that was eating a bird. I remember you got very, very into that. It's just, well, it just was strange. extraordinary. An it extraordinary was. behaviour. <laughs> it was extraordinary. And actually, many people have been talking to me about snakes this uh in the last couple of weeks actually i got to film with some adders this time last year actually is it just a tiny little bit later sort of getting towards the end of that period when you might be able to see them when we've got more sun and i got in touch with them well i tweeted out in the last few days and said how have you all been getting on you know what have you been seeing there's so much rain is it soggy where you are and many people got back to me about snakes which i thought was interesting because really in terms of basking they need the nice warm weather don't they they do, yeah. but I mean, see, we're sat here in the sun at the moment in a sheltered spot, and it, and this would be too warm for snakes. Yeah, because you yes. know, th- there's an enormous difference between the temperature here, say a meter or so above the ground, and the temperature at ground level. Many years ago, Martin Hughes Games and I got some thermometers mm. on a sort of early spring day, and we set them up a, a meter above the ground and then down amongst the grass, and it was like I think it was about five or six, seven degrees difference. Mm. So if you want to see a snake at this time of year sunbathing, you've got to get up early. You know, they're only out there for the first few rays and then it's too warm for them and they're, they're slithering away into the undergrowth. 
Absolutely. And then there's the opposite scale of that, because the day I went out filming with them, it was too cold. And we got, I would say, 20 minutes maximum of good sunlight on that day. And we did manage to film them, but it was was tough. So it's fantastic to see all the different snakes coming in. Tracy Dalton got in touch. She's got grass snakes in her garden. Shabnam seen an adder right in the middle of a path, just sort of came across that. Absolutely stunning. And Bridget Strawbridge has got grass snake, amazing picture of grass snake and slow worm sort of snuggled into each other. Absolutely incredible. So wonderful to see those. And Andrew Edgington also saw a grass snake in his garden. Again, going after one of those frogs, it's got its foot. What is this about them eating them backwards? I don't, I don't know. know. It's a bit bizarre, isn't it? Let me have a look at that. Look, it's got, I mean, it's got hold. That's tricky. It's that's going to be. I mean, again, a you know, it, they're going against the protocol. They haven't read the books. I mean, <laughs> you know, they haven't read the textbooks that were written specifically about them. They haven't. <laughs> By humans. I guess to be quite honest with you, you know, when you're a predator like that, you grab hold of the animal. And what we see, for instance, like mm. what about when ospreys are carrying fish? They catch the fish probably any way they can. But then they turn it round um, so that the fish is facing forward and they put their legs, you know, they've got the feet which they can twist mm -hmm. so that they're then carrying the fish like a torpedo mm -hmm. so that it's it's as streamlined as it can possibly be. And we see the same with kingfishers. They catch fish. They they, they beat them to kill them on, on, on the twigs. Then they turn them round and swallow them, you know, head first. You know, you can't swallow a stickleback backwards. I mean, if you tried that, you'll know it gets stuck in your throat. Um, and the herons are the same. You know, you see them bashing things, they swallow them head first. And I think maybe it's because all of these animals have the ability to manipulate their food after they subdued it. But, of course, the grass snake hasn't... It's a different tactic. Yeah, it's not venomous. No. So if it catches a frog or a toad, it's not, it's not killing it or paralyzing it. It's still vigorous and alive. So it, it can't afford to sort of let it go to turn it round. So maybe they just have to swallow yeah. it from whatever angle they catch it. The books have got it wrong. The books, have, the no. books have got it wrong, which is sometimes quite pleasing, isn't it? To see what uh, actually happens in real life. Interesting stuff. You know, if you've managed to catch something, just get it, get it in whatever way you can. I was very pleased to see that, though, from Andrew Edgington, because I actually know Andrew. I met him on Springwatch Extra a number of years ago. Chris, you will know him as well, because he's a young wildlife artist and... The drawings that he does are absolutely stunning. You'll be able to see one um, on the screen right now, but he's, I'm really interested in how this develops for him because he's had this skill from a very, very young age. He taught me how to think in perspective and look at, really, really look at wildlife when you're drawing it. He's very, very skilled. Uh, he really enjoys the shows as well, and he's doing some good work for wildlife for nature as well. So I wanted to give him a bit of a shout out. This is what he's been up to. I'm Andrew, I'm a young naturalist and unfortunately I have something very sad to tell you but I know more people need to hear it. In the UK a quarter of our mammal species are um, facing extinction right now. I'm trying to stop this by raising as much money as I can to protect them um, by walking 50 miles and pick up, picking up as much rubbish and plastic as I can carry. I started this yesterday and I walked six miles and in that time I picked up over two kilograms of litter. Um, I picked up uh, can, can after can, um, balloons, bottles, basically anything you can think of, um, including small fragments of plastic. And this is absolutely catastrophic for our wildlife because um, animals will congest, uh, ingest it, and they will choke on it. They can become trapped in it um, and indeed they will eventually die and some of this rubbish will reach the oceans and that rubbish will travel across the globe and kill wildlife in its path. Um, I'm asking you to please take part in a um, lockdown litter pickup and use the free time that the coronavirus has given us during the lockdown to clean up your local area, um, your local road, and use the hashtag lockdown litter pickup and post it. Um, and hopefully we can start cleaning up our, um, our country because 
if we can't create a clean environment, what does that say about how much we care about our mammals? Um, I'd also love it if you could sponsor me to walk these 50 miles um, to conserve our native mammals. Thank you very much. Yeah, so there he is. Absolutely brilliant. Well done to you, Andrew. Thank you for doing that. A number of people are saying very well done in the, indeed. Mary Lappin says thank you for what you're doing. Brilliant young person highlighting um, some pretty bad behaviour that people do and trying to rectify it as well. If you would like to donate to what Andrew is doing, and I would encourage you to do that because he's doing a fab job, it is virginmoneygiving.com forward slash Andrew Edgington two at the end I think there is there so please please do do that it's wonderful to see Andrew again I've got to say he was um, a little bit younger when I saw him but still a much better artist than I am now obviously I've been looking through your different photographs your videos as well there's some fab, fab stuff on the self-isolating bird club Facebook page I've got this wonderful picture this is a brown hair just gorgeous you know the fields around me are beginning to be ploughed, so if you're able to get out and have a little look, you might be able to spot uh, a hair or two. Just wonderful from Francis. Thank you for sending that in. At the beginning of lockdown, Chris and Megs, many, many people were connecting with nature in a way that maybe they hadn't done before. And uh, Jane went out and she was cataloguing the trees in her local area and I know we spoke about trees didn't we quite a bit and I just wanted to update you with what she's seen so obviously at the very beginning of spring way back in March we got the the early buds the early leaves well amazingly we're going to move into autumn I don't quite know how we've got to the end of August but this is where her trees are up to so we've been through that very fresh green stage and now you've got things like the acorns and the conkers coming through have you begun to appreciate the passing of the seasons where you are yeah all the acorns the dogs are loving the acorns aren't they're they? eating they're them eating every all day the acorns i found a monstrous one yesterday as well yeah. one of the biggest acorns i've ever yeah. seen i think it could have been a world break world, really? world, record, world record breaking acorn. Well, well, so well, it's well. a bumper season here it does vary doesn't it from location yeah. to location but here mm -hmm. where we are um in the yard and the trees that are surrounding the farm here absolutely mm. loaded with acorns and there are conkers on our yeah. horse chestnut tree they're not fully formed yet they're not opening and falling but those you know they're not quite fist size because mm. i'll be you know yeah. they'll be accused of exaggeration but yeah it's, 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 it's i've got to say as well me and the dogs have been loving the blackberries i love blackberry season yeah. absolutely love it I can't, I can't get go anywhere i can't go for a walk because I'm just constantly picking. Right? Uh, the blackberries in my garden are abundant, mainly because I don't do any weeding. So they are just taken over and we're eating them. It's, it is really wonderful. But many of you are seeing the changes of the seasons. Those conkers are going to come um, into fruition a bit more. Obviously, the acorns are still green at the moment. But just, just good this year, I think, to notice the passage of time because it's been such a strange, strange year. Let's have a look then at something that Walt sent in. This is Walt Davison on Facebook. And he said, I thought this was a strange insect until it let go of its prey. Now, just have a close look at that. Look at the stripes there. Wonderful stuff. Very distinctive, isn't it? This is, I believe, a zebra spider. Yeah. Yeah, and they, these, this is a species of spider which doesn't have a web itself, so it's got these very strong kind of front legs which is able to help catch its prey. So a big fly like that is a, is a, a good meal for a, a zebra spider. Yeah, they've also got brilliant eyesight, those mm. animals. They've got huge, art, well, relative... Mm -hmm. Yes. I do. Yeah, I think we might have just frozen with Chris and Megs there for a moment. As they were talking about the zebra spider, Simon Watts has been on and he's just put zebra spider exclamation mark. But what I enjoyed about that particular piece of footage was, again, the relative sizes of those two different creatures. So that zebra spider taking on something of a similar size to it. But um, it's something that we've covered in various different programmes. And uh, I always like to see when... The, uh, the predator is a similar size to its prey. Uh, final thing that I want to mention to you all is moth night. Now, obviously, end of August, brilliant time to see moths. Many of you getting in touch, actually, with all the different kind of moths that you're seeing at the moment. Caterpillars as well. Obviously, we've spoken about butterflies in other shows. But moth night, James Beaumont wants to get a shout out. It runs from the 27th to the 29th of August. So we are right in the middle of it at the moment. And the focus this year is on the red 
underwing. Now, due to climate change, we believe that they're spreading north, but we want to know just how far they are spreading north. And this is happening across different species as well. It just so happens that we are going to focus on that particular one for this moth night. So get out if you possibly can in the evenings, take a light with you, see what you can spot uh, around your house in your local park, uh, even in your bedroom because, <laughs> because the other night I happened to uh, leave our bedroom light on and when I came back I've got about six moths in the bedroom. So it's a great way to attract them in in the evening. Please do do that. The event is at mothnight.info so go and have a little look at that. I'm, won I'm wondering whether we should uh, answer the quiz. Yes, we certainly should. Hello. Are you back, guys? <laughs> back. Sorry, we have uh, connection issues today. Yeah. That's right. It allowed me to get very excited about zebra spiders for a bit and the size of um, predators and prey. So you let me just go off on one. It was glorious. Oh, Are you going to tell us the answer to the quiz? Because I, I know that I've got this. I know that I've got this because they are my favourites. <laughs> we were not alone in that, Lindsay. Quite a few people have also done quite well on this. So on Facebook, we've got Linda, Barb, Sue, Caroline, uh, Sella, Sandra, Helen, Pam, Janice, Karen, Neil, Carmen, Michelle, Twitter. We've got Wendy, Heather, Chris, Elaine, Helen. On YouTube, we've got Simon, Vivian. I need to take a breath. Heidi, Jackie, Wanda, Hawkbear, Tafan, Kath and Daniel. So well done to everyone who got that right. The answer is hedgehogs. hedgehogs. Of course. Hedgehogs. Yeah. Argumentative hedgehogs. Yes. And I, uh, yeah, the reason I heard them was I went to a hedgehog hospital mm. where there were any number of hedgehogs. Quite arguing. a few hedgehogs. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Hedgehogs. And of course, ties in with, with Hugh. Lindsay, thanks ever so much for joining <laughs> us. Absolute pleasure. I'm going to go and stand outside in the rain now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By myself. The only person on the street, but I don't care because I like it. Coat on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers, Great Liz. time. Thank you. See you later. Bye. 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 <laughs> Well, we're nearly at the end. Any birthdays? We do. We have a few birthdays. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite connected with the internet, so um, I do have a few here, though. So we've got Wilfred, who's 13 on Sunday. Very happy birthday happy to you, birthday. Wilfred. We've got Dawn Smith, who's 66 today. Happy birthday, Dawn. Happy Dawn, yeah. Um, Kerry Priss is 40 tomorrow. Happy birthday, Kerry. Um, we also have a very happy birthday to Mira Papasava, I believe is how we pronounce your name, sorry, um, who is... Uh, I have to say happy birthday to you and your husband, I believe, bought you a very nice book, The Robin, a biography by Stephen Moss, oh, which is a good book. Stephen it's Moss. It's a good present. Very good. He's done a series of those sort of yes. monographs, done the Wren. Yeah, he has. Yeah, it's a great present. I'd be very yep. happy with that. Definitely. Well done there. Happy birthday. Yep. Uh, also, we've got Cookie Jack's um, birthday today. Uh, yeah, so happy birthday to everyone. Top Lots work. Of okay, we're running out yeah. of time. Before we do, just a few updates. So, we've been asking you if you would be so kind as to sign the e action or participate in the e action on the Wild Justice website, which is wild org dot uk slash sos. Obviously, that is in the link here. Please share that if you ha have already signed mm -hmm. it yourself. Uh, it, it's gone up at least 260 since we started this morning. So, <clears throat> Excuse me. I imagine that 260 of you have uh, have done that on account of our pleading. So that we're very grateful to that. But um, keep spreading it throughout the course of the day. Pass it on to other people. How's the shark fin petition? Shark fin has, petition has gone up. So I believe now we are at least at 51,306 signatures. That's before um, that's before my internet went down and I still don't have it back. Um, but that's really great. You know, a really nice improvement. Definitely a few hundred have signed it. So thank you so, so much. Really make a really important difference. It's something the UK government is passionate about changing. So this is a petition that really can have some serious gravity and actually has will you know fingers crossed have some really serious impacts and hopefully we'll be able to stop that loophole and um, protect sharks in uk waters and elsewhere by stopping finning and there's also hedgehog hughes petition as well yeah. of course at eight hundred thousand, you can find that's the government e petition making yeah. it uh, mandatory for new housing developments to have hedgehog highways fitted mm -hmm. in them okay good stuff i'll be back this evening at seven o'clock uh, I'll be talking more about the illegal persecution of uh, of, of our raptors, yes. which will be with Martin Sims from the League Against Cruel Sports. Last night was speaking to Angela Rayner, deputy leader of the Labour, uh, Labour Party, about this, as the Labour Party have said that they would call for a review into driven grouse shooting as means of uh, addressing raptor persecution and other ills associated with that industry. Mm. So that's seven o'clock tonight. Um, I think that's about it, yeah. isn't it? Really? What's coming up? Next week, we have
that's week. the one and only Michaela Strachan is going to be joining us live from South Africa. And Emma Mitchell, who yeah. was going to be joining us last week but had technical issues, uh, will be back week after next. Yes. So we haven't forgotten about Emma. We're really keen to get on and uh, talk to more mm. about her book, The Wild Remedy. Uh, and uh, she's a fantastic, fantastic She's scientist. brilliant. Really, really good. Yeah. So I think we're going to leave you with some uh, white bellied sea eagles. Okay. White bellied yes. sea eagles. White bellied sea eagles. So start to your Friday off. Okay. <laughs> so I'll see you tonight, seven o'clock. Other than that, we'll see you next week at nine o'clock on Friday morning and we hope to have solved our technical difficulties by then. We hope so. <sighs> oh, dear. Have, a good have a good day everyone. Bye. Bye.